Hallelujah. God is good. He is there to supply. He's there to supply that inspiration, that fire that burns, that drives you, that drives you. I want to encourage you also to let the Holy Spirit give you big dreams, big dreams. But you must take those dreams and turn them into vision. What is the difference? Vision has a day-to-day -day execution of that dream. There has to be a practical thing that is done, a work that is done every single day that attains. It's that mission, right? You wake up every morning with a mission to attain the vision so that dream becomes a reality, right? Now, the Holy Ghost wants to give you big, big vision, big, big dream. There are so many things that God has placed in our hands to do. Now, I want to remind you of the awesome things that God is doing. He's spread our name throughout the, throughout the earth. Look around. There's a few people, right? But God has, for, for whatever reason, he has chosen in San Diego, California, the abiding place, to scatter our name across the earth. And there's so much that, that we are currently doing, and there's so much that we are working to do. And we need each and every one of you to participate on every level. Most importantly, on the level with, with who you are as, as a, a child of God, to live out that life, to represent Jesus on the earth with your purpose and your vision. And also to throw in with, throw in with us with your prayers. Your prayers are coveted. Your prayer, understand the, the power of prayer. I want to also encourage you in this. You have got to read this book. I'm giving you a divine assignment. I know you've, You've probably read it. Has anybody read it more than 10 times in here? I'm not kidding. You, as soon as you finish the last page, page 107, start again. This is, su this is such a divine book. This is such, there's so much power. And it's not because Dr. Mark Spitzbergen's name on it. It's because it's the word of God. Look at every page, every, like over half the page is footnotes. It's of the word. Everything that he wrote, it's just scripture woven together in a wonderful, wonderful revelation that the Holy Spirit inspired. It's the word of God, and it's so empowering. The unlimited authority of God, the authority that God has given the, the believers, now nothing is impossible. If nothing is impossible, everything's possible, right? Does that make sense? Read this, guys, read this. Because what the Holy Spirit was saying today, that activation that we have to participate in, when you understand the authority that you have, it becomes so easy because you simply live out who you are. You just be. You just be who you are in God. <clears throat> yeah, it's so, it's ridiculous how accessible, right? So if you don't have the book, you can go to abidingplace.org and you can download it. You can have it on any of your any of your, your tablets, your iPhone, whatever, your computer. Okay? Read that thing. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. The miraculous realms that God has destined for us to live in. So I want to remind you of one of the one of our focal points. There's many, many focal points. And it might look like we're kind of shotgunned around, but it's all part of the plan. Okay? And we need to throw in with all of them. One thing that is so on my heart continually is the Mission Training Center. God is doing such awesome, awesome things. The vision that uh, God has placed in Pastor Mark's heart to see evangelism done like it's never been done before. To see missionaries be trained up and sent, brought in from their nation and sent back to their nation. Right? And then also missionaries from here that are going to be trained up to go out. There's a great job to do. There's a great job to do. And I understand that there's a few people here. I have a master's in business. I can look around and try to calculate each person's contribution and realize, you know what, we might be a little short. But Jesus didn't do that. If you look at what he did when he asked, hey guys, how much food do we have? It's about 5,000 people, right? 7,000 people. Well, we've got five loaves and two fishes. That'll do. It's miraculous. It's miraculous because we're not here to count numbers we're not here to put a, a numerical value on your dollar sign. What we're asking you to do is participate with what you have. That's the realm of the breakthrough. Five loaves and two fish is all it took for there to be a great, great multiplication. It simply doesn't add up a lot of the times. You can try to cut it anyway. You can try to figure out how many pieces you would have to chop. It wouldn't work. It simply wouldn't work. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a realm of the miraculous. 
right? We want you to participate with a realm of the miraculous. I have a goal within 10 years to be living off of 10% of my income and to be giving 90, okay? It's a goal I have. It's a dream, turn it into a vision, and now I have a mission to be able to do that, all right? I want you guys, I'm saying that not to brag on something I'm gonna do, but I know God's gonna bring great wealth into my hands for one purpose, to see the kingdom of God advance. So the gospel will be preached to the uttermost, uttermost parts of the, of the earth, to all the islands. Who is that? Was that Josiah? To all the islands? All the islands, right? To all the islands of the sea. Man, wow, speaking of islands, there, we, need, we, could, we need to be able to go in right now to the Philippines and just have the gospel ready to be preached to bring resources. Did you guys see that, that storm that hit? They're saying it's the biggest storm that has ever, ever hit. It's, it's a disaster, right? We as the church need to be able to go in and just take that because it's so, there's, a, there's desperation. Talk about multiplication needing to be done of food and water. Right? resources, and more importantly, to, to minister to those, those hurting hearts, those des that desperate situation. There's a lot of need in the earth. There's a lot of need in the earth. Let God give you vision. Let him give you purpose. And don't look to yourself. Look to the, look to the realm of the miraculous. Jesus says, look to me. Look at what I can do. Look at what I can do with your small offering. It's the small offerings that touch the heart of God. It's, it's wild. It's wild because we would see it as completely insignificant. But God looks at it. Look at the heart behind it. It's the heart behind it, right? The woman with the two mites, she came and she, out, of, out of her poverty, right? She gave. She gave. So I want to encourage you to come and participate. Give bountifully. Give bountifully and let God bless. I guarantee you that God can do a lot more with your resources than you could ever hope to attain, okay? I'm serious. I'm not trying to belittle anyone, but your job really isn't cutting it for us. Your salary isn't really cutting it for us. We've got a big vision and we need a lot more. Now that's not to put on any, you're not good enough. That's to say, you know what? Look at, just, just step back, take emotion out of it, and just be a little objective and say, yeah, that's what I'm making. That's what I'd like to give. Father, I need a miracle. And we need a miracle. And guess what? God loves to do miracles. He loves to do miracles. He wants to do a miracle for each and every person in this place, financially, spiritually, physically. And he wants you to participate with the miracle that he has of this church. I see this church as a miracle church. Every person in here I see as a miracle soul. You're a miracle. You're a miracle. Why? First and foremost, because the, the gift of salvation is a miracle, right? The sustaining life of Jesus is a miracle. You might think that you're keeping yourself safe and that you're, you're living life in such a way that you're surviving, right? God is the one who sustains you. It is God that sustains you with breath, with, with su sustenance, with everything you need, right? Look to the source. Look to the source. I am so blessed that I don't have to look at any of you for the source. No offense, but we look to Father as the source. He's the source, but he has a law. He has a law of sowing and reaping. And he says, I'm the source, but come participate. Sow bountifully and you'll reap bountifully. Amen? So I want you to prepare an offering to come and give to the Father. I want you to live this day for radically for Jesus in everything you do. When we look at it, what, is the, what, is, what does the psalmist say? Our life is as a handbreadth, short, very short. We have a short time to live for Jesus. Let's live radically for Jesus, to live radically for Jesus. I love, I love legacy. I love to study companies and, and different things that they've been around for 100 plus years. There's a legacy there. It's cool. There's something that lasts. More importantly, I love the legacy of the church. Let's represent the church as it, is, as it is purposed to be represented with a divine legacy, to participate with that. There's something about it. I think there's something that God just put within us. There's something about that collective body, that collective group, that excitement, to participate with something that is so much bigger than any individual. And it's all about Jesus Christ, to participate with Jesus Christ. What a radical invitation. What a radical call. Amen? Hallelujah. God is so good. 
I think that was everything that I wanted, huh? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Is everybody ready to give? Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. This is very important. This is very important to me. I want you to hear faith. I want you to hear faith because if you will hear faith out of that, you will see the miracle. That's why we preach the word, right? You might ask, why is it that we do service the way we do service? Okay, To prepare your heart through worship, to come and give that sacrifice, then to speak the word, right? And then typically at the end, we'll pray for people. Why is that? Because Jesus speaks the word, right? Out of that hearing of the word, right? Faith is, is activated. Faith is stirred up, right? Always give out of that out of that position of just glory, honor, praise, and faith. Let faith arise in your heart to see greatness. Greatness in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Hallelujah. Come and give. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the, your blessing upon these offerings. Lord Jesus, I thank you for great multiplication. For great multiplication. Father, that your presence overwhelm every person. Father, that faith is stirred in every heart. In Jesus' mighty name. Oh, we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory and honor to your name. Thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blessing. Thank you, mighty God. Pastor Stewart, will you come up? We want to see great miracles in the house tonight. Who needs a miracle? A physical miracle, spiritual, financial. You need a miracle in the place. Good. Come come with the need. Always coming with the need. Absolutely. Amen. Hallelujah. Absolutely. I got it. I'm good. I'm good. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. I just so stirred up about that last thing he just said. Anybody needs a miracle? The Father, Father wants to do a miracle for you. This is, this is his desire. Jesus loved to do miracles. Therefore, we love miracles. Miracles are not about the grandness of man. They're not about the greatness of what we can say and how smart we are or how good we speak or, or how much faith we have. They're just about what Jesus loves to do. He loves to do miracles. He loves to bless people. I mean, he blessed us so much that he died a horrible death for us. I mean, how much more does he want to bless us with all the fullness of the kingdom? And in the fullness of the kingdom, there's a blessing for your spirit. There's a blessing for your body. There's a blessing for your life in every way. This is what Jesus has done for us. He has given unto us freely these great things. That miracle that you need, as you take it before the Father, as you take it in the name of Jesus, and you say, this miracle, this, this I need. Look at it. Say, Father, I need a miracle. And begin to seek after him. Say, Lord, how do I receive this miracle that you've given? It's, it's so good when you need healing to open up the Word of God and study all the scriptures on healing. I mean, it's simple these days. Just get your computer, your iPod, your whatever out and you plug in heal, and you search, and you can find you know, days worth of stuff to read about healing. You can find it in every single book, nearly every chapter of the New Testament. Somebody's getting healed. Somebody's talking about getting healed. Somebody's getting blessed. It's there. It's not something that's a far off. We have made it in our modern society something far off. You know, we, I, I saw somebody get healed, I think, once, three years ago, something like that. I mean, this is how we think about it. But no, for us, it's an every day, every week occurrence. This is how we live. We live in the blessing of God. Even every breath I take is such a blessing. I breathe in. You know, it's amazing. If you think about what happens when people pass from this life into the next, as we say, or they pass away, or they die, or they go to sleep, or whatever you want to call it, what happens? One of the things that happens is the lungs collapse, and all the breath, that's in them goes out, and there's a big sigh. Very few of you, a couple of us here I know, have watched this happen. I mean, most people have never watched it, They've never seen it, because it's removed so far from, from our experiences. But the, the lungs are constantly trying to collapse. If we just took them 
the way they are, their natural state is they would suck together. And it's only by the energy of your diaphragm moving and your muscles moving and the fact there's a little bit of soap in there to break up the surface tension, it's only by that fact that your lungs even can open. Otherwise, it takes huge amounts of pressure to open them. And you just you have to breathe really hard. Could you imagine having to just work? You have to put a lot of work into it. every breath. But we don't. We don't, because God gave us life. He breathed into us the breath of life. And every breath we take is a blessing from him. If you got nothing else to be thankful, just be thankful you're breathing. It's important. But when that life goes out of man, it just, it just sucks down together, and the breath goes out. Big sigh. And they're gone. The body has ceased to function, and the soul and the spirit stand in heaven or hell, depending upon the deeds done in the body. This is important for our life, to be thinking about where we're going to go and what we're going to do. The Bible talks about how ignorant people are about the things that they don't know about what has happened in the past. People think, that the world is going to remain the same as they've always known it to be. And they're so full of their own mind that they think that the world is just the, the 15, 35, 55 years they've been on the line, on, on the earth. But there's been a lot of time before, and there's going to be a lot of time after. And there's many things that have happened, and many, many great and mighty nations, many great and mighty peoples, armies, whatever it is, that have fallen and they've gone by the wayside. And we find things constantly. You know that even today, they're digging up stuff and finding out stuff about history in the past that they didn't know. They didn't know. I mean, they go and they stick a spade into a place they've never done before, and they dig up. They go, Whoa, wait, oh, this is different. We had no idea. They're still finding out. We think we're so smart. We know so much. But there have been great many people that have lived on the earth, and they had their opportunity to walk with God and all that they knew. They had an opportunity. Some of them walked with him in greatness. We read about some in the Bible. The great things they did by faith and through faith and in faith and all the things that they did, mighty things that are so true. I tell you also that the Word of God, no matter what anybody tells you in school, no matter what some book wrote someplace, some article you saw on the Internet, the Word of God always comes out right in the end. It always does. I'm telling you it does. There are many. There was a book written by some people saying, you know, everything before the divided monarchy period, that's the part after David when the country split into two, two places, so there were two monarchies as opposed to one. Everything before that is a myth. It's all made up. It's all fake. It's the word of God not. It's not. It's not because it's completely made up. The guy wrote the book. A bunch of people believed the book. It was all the rage. And you know what happened just shortly thereafter? Somebody said, whoa, whoa, time out. Come out. Wait a minute. We just found this, and we just found that, and we just found it. It's amazing. The Bible always turns out to be true, even when men claim it's not. It always does. Even today, you go to school, and even the modern people will teach you stuff that's not true because they really want the Bible to be false. They want it to be wrong. They want to exclude it because it always turns out to be wrong. So, why is this all important? How do we get here? Well, I was looking in Psalms 19. Verse 7. I was thinking about the Word of God. This is an opportunity. My, my son called me today. I told Daniel and Geneva before the service. He, he called us. He's on his way from North Carolina to D.C. But he calls us, and he didn't get to watch the service this morning. My boys in back east tend to watch the services here. They don't get to see them live. They'll watch them on the YouTubes now. And, um, you know, so like Jeremy, he goes to church. And then when he leaves church, he goes and watches the bunny plays. That's, that's how it works. Is it three hours different? And James always catches him later, but he said, I was driving, he calls me up and says, hey, I heard you guys had an awesome service this morning. That sounded great. He said, I heard you shouted the hotel down. I'm going, man, we just had it this morning. It's already clear across the country. How much further is it going to go? Okay, it's that simple, but it's that excitement for what goes on. So it's everywhere. But I was thinking about, you know, we needed to minister the word. We need to talk about the word a little bit. So there's a great psalm. You should see it there, Psalms 19, verse 7. that talks about the word of God. I call this the psalm of the word of God. It's something that I remember very, very well because it's one of the first songs. You've heard me probably talk about songs from the early days of the abiding place. There was a song out of this psalm that Pastor Mark wrote by the Spirit. 
way back when he wasn't even Pastor Mark then. And uh, did I did you lose me? Oh, and he and he wrote this song. And so it starts out: the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I mean, this is this is this is how great the Word of God is. This is why you need to spend time every day. It's a good policy. You know, many people have written their daily breads, like Pastor Mark does. Many people have written their encouragements, the scripture reading for the day. Many denominational churches, you go to youth, Lutheran churches, they're all reading the same scripture every week. They got an Old Testament reading, got a New Testament reading, got something from the Psalms or Proverbs that they're reading, and they have a specific thing. Why? Because they learned a long time ago you need to get the word in people. And this was a way to do it. It's very different now because you've got so many more so much more access to it than, you, than they used to. But the law of the Lord, it's perfect. Converting the soul. And the testimony of the Lord is sure. When, when God testifies something, you know it's true. It's true. Making wise the simple. I'm simple. I'm very simple. I know that God loves me and that he's given me of his spirit and he's given me of his word and he's put his life on the inside of me. It's just that simple. And all the things that try to tell you it's different, all the complications of it, doesn't matter. It's just simple. I know that the testimony of the Lord is sure. He tells me some things. We're going to probably see a few things here later. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You want to get joyful? You can get joyful in that you're taking a breath, and you get joyful in the statutes of the Lord. You can read them and go, oh, this is so true. I mean, you can just sit in Proverbs all day long, just reading Proverbs and just going, wow. That's amazing. That's so true. That's obviously true. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's good. They're, they're, they rejoice your heart. You know, it's great. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. You want to see clearly? Look at the pure commandments. You know, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. Jesus talked about the fact that broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go there. And narrow and straight is the way that leads to life. And few there are that go there. It's the same thing. These things, it's absolutely true. How do I know I'm on the right word, right road, the right place? How do I know I'm on the straight and narrow path? Well, the word tells me. The commandment of the Lord's pure and enlightens my eyes. The, Lord, the word is a lamp unto my feet and it lights my path. I acknowledge him in all my ways and he directs my path. I can know these things. I know that if I do it his way, that I will have his result. This is what I'm going to do. So when I need direction, I stand here and I say, okay, I've got this sermon, I got that one, I got this one, I got that one. I can talk about this and that and this and that. I can read about this and that. I don't know which way to go. Don't know. So I just ask the Lord. I say, Holy Ghost, come and fill me up. Give me a place to begin. And this is what happens. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired, or as the song goes, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. It's a great song. I mean, I used to just love it. We'd sing it for hours. We just, we just sit there and we just revel in the Word of God. All day long. It was just so much fun. I mean, I was an early to bed, early to rise guy. I mean, I, everybody who knew me back then knows. And still, you know, 10 o'clock, I turn into a pumpkin. It's time to go to sleep. Okay? <laughs> I, I just need to go to sleep because I, I sleep. And then I rise early. I love early morning. I'm an early person, right? But there was one thing that could keep me up late. It's only one. It's only one thing. It's the Word of God. And it was church. I'd stay up late for that. I'd do it as long as it took. And then I'd rise early and I'd do my thing in the morning. But it's wonderful. But moreover, by them, by the commandments of the Lord, is thy servant warned? Is thy servant warned? And in keeping of them, there is great reward. This is so true. His commandments are so wonderful. They're so beautiful. You can just sit there and just look at them and go, God, you're so perfect. I mean, he has made a salvation that requires no pride of man in it. He's made a salvation where his 
his things, everything he wants is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, my grace is sufficient. Paul said that God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. And everything about what you do is made perfect in your weakness. In your weakness, what you do. I live in a weakness of myself and a strength in God. There are times when I stand in the strength of myself. There are times when I begin to step out and go, I can do this. I've got it. I've got this taken care of. I'm busy about many things. And you know what happens? You get deviated from the path. You get messed up. Things, things get mixed up in your mind, but you can always turn back. You can always say, oh, God, forgive me. Help me. Give me back to your word. And you start thinking the word of God. Give thanks. I wasn't giving thanks. In fact, I was agitated and upset. Lord, forgive me. Let me give thanks. Lord, I thank you. You're so good. I thank you for the son. Whatever you got to thank him for. You thank the Father because he gave us commandment that if we do it his way, we get his result. Isn't that true? It's so true. Who can understand, verse 12, his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. I'm going to sit there and, and judge God. I'm going to sit and say, oh, well, you know, God, if you just done it that way, if you just put me in this position, if you just told me about that, I mean, we can think this. We don't actually put it that way, but that's essentially what we're doing is we're, we're thinking about, oh, it could have happened different. Oh, I should have this. I would have that. All of these things we say, and what we're really saying is, God, you didn't lead me correctly. That's what we're saying. We're going to judge God for his errors. We're going to actually say he failed somehow. No, he never, he's never failed me. Not one time has he ever failed me. Never. If anybody's failed, it's me. But he is sufficient to pick me up, no matter what the failure, when I will choose to repent and do it his way. It's an amazing thing. It's amazing. So, keep back thy servant also. You keep me from presumptuous sin. You know, the scripture also says, where Jesus teaches them how to pray, and it says, Lord, keep me from the evil. Keep me from evil. You know, it's the Lord who keeps us from evil. If it wasn't for the Lord, if it wasn't for the Spirit of the Lord, all my ways would tend unto evil. Because everything of the world tends to evil. If I live my life following the world, if I live my life turned unto the world, I will tend to evil. But if I live my life with the statutes and the Word of God in front of me, and I follow these things, I would tend unto life. This is what we want to do, right? So he says here, keep me back. Keep back your servant, Lord, from presumptuous sin. Oh, God, I don't want that sin in my life that will damn my soul to hell. There are so many examples. Jesus talks about it in Mark. Paul talks about it in multiple places. Peter writes about it. It's written over and over by the Holy Ghost. Lists the works of the flesh. The most common one we know of is Galatians 5. Works of the flesh are manifested. This is what they are. This is how you know what they are. This is what you see. And then he begins to list them. Adulteries and fornications and murders and hatreds and deceits and lying and all of these things. He says, these things you know cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Cannot. And yet men go about their lives in presumptuous sin and claim that they're right with God. We know we have an advocate. If you will repent, if you will call upon his name, he'll take you out of it. But we want, here's where I would be, Lord, keep me back. Don't allow me to step into presumptuous sin. Keep me from the evil, Lord. Every day, pray that prayer. Every day, ask the Lord, Lord, you keep me from the evil. I thank you for your keeping power. This is how you keep yourself. We know whosoever is born of God does not sin. But he that is begotten of God, he keeps himself. And the wicked one does not touch him. How does that happen? Because you agree to say to the Lord, you are my strong tower. You are my strength. Keep me back from presumptuous sin. Because if I was left to my own devices, that's where I would end up. Because if the days are not shortened, even the very elect would be saved, would be, would be deceived. Deception is so great. And we're not able in our own strength to, to do it. There's a way that seems right to a man. You look at a situation, you think, oh, this is the right way to go. It leads to death. You sit and dwell in your mind and you think, this is what I'm going to do. It leads to death. Go by the word of God. No matter what you see, 
no matter what you judge, no matter how you feel, well, I'm, I'm hurt because that person treated me so wrongly. And the Bible tells you, forgive. When you pray, forgive. Because if you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. Then your prayer is it's worthless. Forgive. I don't care what they did to you. I don't care how badly they treated you. I don't care how miserable it was. It's, it doesn't matter. I've heard, believe me, I've heard stories none of you want to hear about things that people have done to other people, especially children, because I take care of children. You hear these things, and you think, now, there's got to be, you know, people tell you, there's got to be a special place in hell for people like that. Not really. It's all the same, hell. It's all the same. The only special place is the one who had the right, knew the word of God, knew what they were supposed to do, walked to Jesus and turned away. That's, that's a special one. That hurts. That hurts. But anyway, I, I digress. So, Father, we thank you for your word. So that's what we want to study tonight, is we want to study the word of God. We want to study what the word of God has to say. And there's so much to be said. One of the hardest things when you're, when you're ministering the word with people is, is everybody along with you? Are we following along? Do we know what we're talking about? Because I want to talk about some things that they're going to maybe they're going to tax you just a little bit. I want you to think about it. So I want to start laying the groundwork in Second Peter. Chapter 3. I, I made reference to it. I just want to lay this out for you to get you ready for what we're going to talk about. Okay? I'm going to teach you something. Uh, chapter 3, verse 3 says this. Well, we'll just start at the beginning of chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. So who's he writing to? He's writing unto the beloved. He's writing to the ones he loves. He's not writing unto sinners. He's not writing unto people that don't know God. He's not writing to people that are far off. He's writing to us, that we're right here. We're in the place. We're the faithful ones. We're the ones that are in the church. We're the ones giving. We're the ones shouting. We're the ones praying. We're, this is who he's writing to, right? In both, to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. We want, to, we want to stir up your pure minds to remember something. Knowing this first, first of all, know this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Some men count slackness but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I mean, listen to that, his heart. He's not willing that one of us be lost. In fact, he's not willing that one of anybody outside of us be lost. And so our, our goal is to do that. We're gonna, this is what we're going to get to. Our goal is to reach those people out there. Okay? We're going to reach everybody in here and keep them, and we're going to reach everybody out there because we've been kept in here. Okay? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. I want to just digress a moment. Pastor Daniel was mentioning about the um, storm in the Philippines and how great it was, and it's the greatest that we know of in our modern era. Do you realize that in ancient times, there were clearly things that happened that were much worse? There was, there was an entire volcano near Greece, they blew up at one time. And if you read ancient history, there's, they're always arguing about what era it was. Nobody's even sure exactly when it happened. But we know that there was an entire civilization destroyed, and this volcano blew up and covered 
the whole area around there, all the way around where Israel is, Assyria, down into Egypt, covered it with darkness. So it was like London back in Dickens' time, where you couldn't see the sun for, for months, maybe years. Nobody's really quite certain. And everything changed. Famine, armies moving, people with no food, trying to get food from the people that had it. And it was complete destruction. That's worse than anything we've ever thought about. And that happened. I mean, it happened. It's recorded. It's clearly understood. Probably much of it happened, I believe, about the time when you hear about the uh, dial on the sun going back. That's the time. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's incredible. But, so I digress. I want you to understand, that when he says these things, the day of the Lord will come, thief not. there's greater things coming. There's been worse things. There's going to be worse things. But see, none of these move us. We just need to understand. There's a lot going on that's bigger than you. So, verse 11, seeing then that all these things, everything you see, all this earthy stuff will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, a manner of living and godliness? What kind of people ought you to be? Seeing that at any moment something like that could happen. For the people in the Philippines, it happened. It's not something they're reading about and going, wow, that's interesting. No, they live in it, and it's misery. For the people in New Orleans a few years back, or the people on the coast over here and over there, for the people in the great earthquake when we had the fires, whatever it might be, people live through those things. They live it. And suddenly, all these things that are going to be dissolved, they don't seem quite so important. Their breath is very important for them, how to breathe. So he wants you to say, seeing all of this, understanding how big and vast all of this is, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto, looking for and running towards the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, what are we looking for in all of that? New heavens and a new earth wherein dwells I like to put in only righteousness. There's another place that says only righteousness. That's all that'll be there. Righteousness. There'll be no sin. There'll be no presumptuous sin. It'll all be dealt with. Isn't that great? I mean, this is great. So we fix our eyes upon this goal. Okay? And it's important we understand that when we do these things, what, what Peter talks about, if you read the rest of Peter, I don't have time to read all of it. When you read the rest of that chapter, you read the chapters before, you read the book before. I read all of them earlier this morning. When you read it, you find out he's telling you about all the things he wants you to do, how holy he wants you to walk, how, how to walk in your life. And these things are good. What I want you to understand is the people in this church that have been here for any length of time at all, they understand this. They understand how to walk in pureness and holiness. And I want you to know it's important. It's not a little thing to be faithful. It's not a little thing to serve in the church. It's not a little thing to help when we need laborers. It's not a little thing to minister to the kids on the street or to minister in the kids' camp that we were doing or minister with the children's church or minister with the youth groups. These are not little things. They're all big things, and they're wonderful things. Because when we talk about some of the things we're going to talk about, people lose sight of how vast is everything and at the same time, how much God loves it when you do even the littlest thing. He says, if you give a cup of water to a prophet, you obtain a prophet's reward. It's that simple. So you never want to find yourself judging what you do by these earthly things. Never find yourself. Never take the exhortation to go deeper, the exhortation to, to pray longer, the exhortation to seek more fervently, never take that as condemnation. Never refuse to do that. In Jesus, in the Holy Ghost, there is no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh. Romans chapter 8. It's, this is where we live. No condemnation. I am not condemned of Him. He came to save me. I'm prepping you for this. Because there's something we're going to ask. The Holy Ghost wants us to understand something, and it's going to put a little pressure on you. When you hear, feel the pressure, it's not pressure for you. 
not pressure for me. It's knowing that God has called us to something. And we heard a little bit of it this morning. Actually heard a lot of it this morning. It was powerful. I heard it when Kelly got up and by the Holy Ghost began to say, speak with your mouth. Don't sit in the thoughts of your mind. I spent years in the thoughts of my mind. My mind was pretty prodigious, you know. I could think a lot of thoughts really fast. But you know what? The thoughts of your mind will twist and deceive and take you out. It doesn't have to take you far. Because remember, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. It's the way of life. So we put in our mouth the word of God. Okay. So knowing all of that. So I, I didn't do a very good job. But let's understand something. It's so big on the one hand. And Peter talks about all the little things you do. I want you to see the vastness of it. So that you don't get lost into thinking that somehow you're a failure. Because you're not. Jesus makes you. So let's go to Mark chapter 4. There's something that we want to talk about in Mark chapter 4 that's very, very, very intense. You ought to know the parable. And in verse 3, he says, listen, 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 listen. I want you to hear this. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And he begins to speak the parable. And I'm just going to skip through it because I think you, most of you know it don't know it, you can read it yourself in that chapter. It's also in like Luke 8, and is it John something or other, I can't remember. Matthew 19, I think. It's, I mean, it's, it's different places, different things like this. But he says, the sower went forth to sow. What is the sower sowing? If you look in the interpretation of it, we just skip to that. Verse 14 says, the sower sows the word. Sowing the word. He's giving forth the word of God. He's throwing the word of God out there, right? And these are they by the wayside, verse 15, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, when they heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And, th and that it's, it's unprofitable to them. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They go, oh, that's really good. I like that. But they don't have any root in themselves. And so they endure, but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. They can't deal with it. And these are they which are sown among thorns. They hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that wonderful? So we all can say, testify, I want to be good ground. Lord. Okay? So I remember way, way, way back when I first heard Pastor Mark talk about, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm ministering by the word, and I'm busting up rocks, and I'm taking out thorn bushes. Okay? This is what I'm going to do. And when I first heard that, I was kind of like, I don't, I don't quite understand. What are you telling me? I didn't. Get, I really didn't get it very well. I hadn't grown up with these things, so I mean, I was. I thought I was pretty smart, but I gave in. I said, "Lord, what is going on?" But I began to understand because you read the Word, and now you understand what he's talking about. He's just talking about these simple things. We're going to bust some rocks with the Word of God. Why? Because there's rocks get in the way of your ground, and we got ministers for our perfection. And one of the good things they can do with the Word of God is they can find those rocks and they'll bring the hammer and they'll bust the thing up so it doesn't choke the Word so that you're not offended when you're persecuted. There's a thorn bush that's got to be taken out. You ever take out a thorn bush? It's a lot of work. David and I took out a grapevine out of my, a year ago or something like that. And we had two of them. We got one out. The other one we couldn't get out. We just gave up. We are tired. It was late. It's still there. It's a lot <laughs> of work to get these things out of the ground. So you're the pastor and you're seeing by the Spirit thorn bushes. And you're going, i got to get that thorn bush out of there. The cares of this life are going to choke the Word and it's going to be unfruitful. I can speak the greatest, smoothest sermon ever spoken and it will do me no good. Because there's a thorn bush choking the Word when it springs up. So this is what happens. So you need to learn how to endure the Word of God being preached. 
I mean, it can be, it can be like a Dewey's fest. You just really, oh, how long? But it's good because we're going to tear out those thorn bushes. We're going to bust up those rocks. We're going to make a difference. So the, this, this parable of the sower is extremely, extremely important for your life. It's, a, it's one you want to know. And it's a good prayer to begin to pray, Father, I want to be good ground. Bust up the rocks in my life. Tear out the thorn bushes in my life. And when you see the cares of this life choking the word in your life, you begin to notice it. Thank God. Don't go, oh, I'm such a loser. Say, thank God you showed it to me. Because I didn't even know the thorn bush was there until the word of God came and sprung up. And then the word of God began to be choked. And I go, oh, my. There's a thorn bush tearing me up because I've got this care of this life that I've got to let go of, right? But after this, he said to them, this is where we really wanted to get. All this was preparation for this. Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel, like a bushel basket? Do you cover the candle up? No. Or put it under the bed? Or is it to be set on a candlestick? It's supposed to be up on a candlestick, right? So it brings light. For there is nothing hid, there's nothing hid that will not be manifested. You realize when you sit in a place like this, there's nothing in your life that will be hidden. No. If I might not know what it is. I, I don't know what Pastor Mark knows or what's been revealed to him because he doesn't talk about it. I, unless he's talking about it up here. So I don't know what he sees. And, I, and, and you don't know what I see or what anybody else sees. But let me tell you something. There's nothing about your life that God doesn't see. There's nothing about your life the Holy Ghost doesn't know. And that's a whole lot more important than whether somebody like me knows. Okay? But there's nothing that's going to be hid. Why? Because the Word of God is going to manifest. It's going to be up on the candlestick. It's going to make it manifest. All the darkness is going to be removed, taken care of. For there is nothing here which not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it will come abroad. Everybody will know about it. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, here's the, here's the word to you. Take heed what you hear. Take heed. And with what measure you measure out, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given. And he that has not from him shall be taken away even this is, this is one of those hard sayings. It's a difficult one. Most people don't really understand what it's talking about. But I want you to get the context of it, and I want you to understand this in the context of how vast everything is God knows, how big everything is going on out there, and how wonderful it is the littlest things you do. From God, a cup of water for the prophet. Don't forget those two things, because this is what he's talking about. He's telling you that when you hear the word of God, what this is really about is you speaking it. That's what this is really about. He says, with what measure you give out, it will be measured to you. We need to be speaking the word of God. This is what, this is what it's telling us. If you've not been speaking out the word of God enough, then you cry out, Holy Ghost, help me. I need to speak out the word more. For with whatever measure you give out, it would measure to you. And unto you that hear, you hear and hearken, more will be given to you. What is hearing and hearing the word of God? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, it says. I always translate that for myself. Hearing and acting upon or doing the word of God. The hearkening, when you hearken, if I say to Tyler, Tyler, close the door. He can hear me, don't really do it. He can hear me. He understands what I said. But if he just stands there and the door doesn't get closed, he did not hear me or he did not hearken to the word. You understand? So when God comes to you and says, I want you to pray earnestly like this, and you say, oh, that's really cool. That's great. And you go away and just you don't you forget what happened. It's like we behold ourselves in the mirror of the Word of God, and we see everything God did for us, then we walk away and forget what manner of man we are. We just walk away going, I, I just forgot. That's really cool in church. And then I go, I go about my daily life, and I forget what God told me about myself. 
He told me that every word I speak will be judged. He told me that my words have power on earth, great power. He told me that if I bind on earth, it's bound in heaven. He told me that if I loose on earth, it'd be loosed in heaven. Our words have great power. So what he's talking about here, he says this, take heed how you hearken. Take heed, listen, watch your life. Take heed. He says, because with what measure you give out, not how much you hear in the sense of it goes into your ear and into your brain, but what you give out. That measure, that's what's going to be given to you because if you have a little and you give out the little, guess what happens? You get more. This is why at the end, what's, what's going to be in here, what goes on is he talks about the parable. There's a couple of different ones where he says, I'm going away, going to a far country. You know that Jesus went away, and he told us it was good that he went away because if he goes away, if I don't go away, the comforter can't come to you. But if I go away, we will send, Father and I are going to send him to you. And that's the most glorious Holy Ghost, which is so wonderful. We just love the Holy Ghost. We love to call upon the Holy Ghost. We love to hear the Holy Ghost. We love to, to praise even the Holy Ghost because he's so wonderful, right? And he reveals Jesus in our life. So this, this great thing, we, we have this. He said, I'm going away. And he went away into a far country. We couldn't follow him. You can't go where he is in a natural sense. We couldn't, you know, build an airplane and fly up and land where Jesus ascended to. You can't do it. You can fly up there all day long, go in and out of the clouds. You're not going to find it because it's, you can only go there by the Spirit. And thankfully, we got heaven on the inside of us and we can go to heaven by the Spirit. But that's another sermon. If you've heard it before, you'll hear it again. It's a wonderful thing. But here he says, for him that hath, him shall be given. In this parable I'm talking about, when Jesus went away, he took and he said, I'm going to give to you five pounds. And I'm going to give to you three. And I'm going to give to you one. And then he went away. And then when he comes back, he comes and examines and says, what did you do with your five? And he says, I gained five. And he goes, he's a good servant. And he goes to the one three, I gained three more. Good servant. He goes to the one who gained one, did one. And he goes, well, I was just really concerned about what I was going to do with this. And I knew that you were just really hard and there's just so much about you that's so beyond what I could ever do. So I wrapped it in a napkin and buried it in the ground. And here it is. I'll give it back to you. And what did the Lord call him? Wicked servant. Now think about that for a minute. Wicked servant. Do you want to be wicked? I don't want to be wicked. Absolutely not. Wickedness is not good. You're thinking, but he was just scared. He was just afraid. He just didn't want to take the one pound and lose it. He didn't want to mess it up. He didn't want to be a bad representative of the kingdom of heaven. So he just hid it in the earth. In other words, he heard the word of God but he did not hearken, and he did not give out of that which he heard. And because he did not give out, he did not receive more, because what happened? The Lord took that pound from him and gave it to the one that already had 10. And when it talks about pounds, you know, it's, it's gold. It's talking about money in the, in the parable, but it's just really what God gives to you. He's giving to you the word of God. He's saying to you, you must be born again. You hear that word. So then you take that word and you go to somebody else and say, you must be born again. Some man came to me in a hotel room 34 years ago and said, you must be born again. And I heard the word and I fell upon my knees and I said, Lord, come into my heart. And I was changed from that very moment. Just that simple. He called upon his name. But what did he do? He took heed what he did with what he heard. He'd heard the word, and so then he gave out. With what measure you give out, I mean, in the old English it says, with what measure you meet. And nobody knows what that means, okay? It says, with what you give out, 
I've got the word in me. In fact, the covenant that we have, it's been promised to me. He wrote it in my heart. He wrote the covenant in my heart. It's in here. I don't even really have to have this. I don't have to have the Bible necessarily to have the word in me. I've got the word of God. I mean, I, I love the story of Brother Yoon in his book talked about how his mother had been taught some things in the gospel and she had it all twisty round and messed up, but she was, she got this part. Jesus is in there somewhere, you know, and, and it was, it, you read it, it's really kind of hilarious. But you know what? She spoke it and he got, his father got healed. People got saved. And he got led on a journey that ended up where he's at now, which is just incredible. It's a great book to read. It's just, it's, it's, it's stir your faith. To see that. It's wonderful, right? I mean, we talk about how perfectly we can parse the verse. That's great, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about hear the word of God, what comes to you by the Spirit, comes to you and tells you, don't think in your mind, speak it out. Speak it out in prayer and speak it out and testify. How do you overcome the enemy? The blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. You got to speak it out. I'm going to tell you, when you hold it in, you're like that wicked servant. That's brutal. You think about it. It's kind of rough. But you know what? I don't want to be a wicked servant. I just don't want to be. So I need to speak it out. And if you want to start with, you know, two hands for beginners, do it with one another. Just talk about the word of God. It'll build in you. And, and go in prayer and say, Lord, I want to learn how to be a preacher. So I'm going to preach into the mirror. I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to tell you everything that's in my heart. And I'm going to grow in it. There's a long time. But that's all I did. I preached to myself in the car. That's what I did. Because I didn't have a place to preach, and I wasn't a very good street preacher. I tried it. It didn't work for me. I tried it. I just wasn't that good at it. And, you know, maybe I just because I was a failure, but it, I, who knows? The point of it is that you find a place, any place, and you begin to set yourself to say, Lord, I'm going to take my one pound. I'm going to take my single talent. I'm going to take whatever I got, my gold that you've given to me, this precious word, this diamond, this jewel that's come into my life, and I'm going to speak it out. I'm going to talk about it everywhere I go. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's perfect. It converts the soul. This law of the Lord, this word of God, I'm going to speak it out. I'm going to live it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to remind my family about it. We're going to talk about it amongst each other. You know, it's, it's just constant talking about the word of God. Stop being that way. Don't do that. Don't act that way. It can happen that way. And you know, you just take it to heart. It's okay. I was too loud. I was too this, I was too that, I was too much this way, too much that way, whatever. We're talking about the word. We're going to be gentle with one another, be loving with one another. We're going to encourage one another in the word. And then from there, we're going to take it out. We're going to take it out into the highways and the byways. And we're going to speak this word. We're going to be a sower now. We're going to go and we're going to sow the word indiscriminately. We're not going to judge the ground. That's not my role. I, I can't do that. We so often will take the Word of God and say, well, this is not an appropriate place for it. That's not good ground. Or that's not a good place. Or this isn't going to work out. Or I don't see this turning out to be a very good crop. If you're doing that, you're missing it. Speak the Word. Now, in the church, when you've got people who are set into a place to be perfecting the saints, they'll take a look at some rocks and some trees and thorn bushes and whatever else, and they'll deal with them by the Spirit, and they'll deal with them. It's an important part. Yes, it's going to happen, but that's not what we're doing. Do the work of an evangelist is not do the work of judging the ground. You know, oh, well, I'm not going to preach to you because there's no way you'd receive it. You, you know, you, you messed up. Can't do that. Sower went forth to sow, and he sowed the word indiscriminately. And Jesus taught us another place that that seed, that little hard thing of a mustard seed is so tiny. And yet when you sow it, it grows into a great bush. Just like that. any seed will do. Just, just think about what happens. You take a seed, this tiny little thing, and out of it grows this great thing. 
it's, it's amazing. Word of God hits a powerful seed. It puts out a serious, serious vine, very strong vine, and it comes up. There's only one thing that can destroy it. The sun and persecution, the cares of this life, the things of this earth. So we were talking about this earth, the things of this earth. These, these things, they get in our way because we stop looking at things by the word of God and by the spirit, begin to judge by the natural. We begin to ponder what is wrong, how it works, why it's that way, why so-and-so did that. What are they thinking about me now? Why did they, why did they say that to me? Why? All these thoughts, they just they come in, give place. No, I'm not going to sit and think about that. I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to speak the word. This word of God says what? He says this. He that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that simple. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how many times you've done it. You call upon the name of the Lord, he'll save you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, he delivers them out of them all. He delivers me. Whatever it might be, we started off talking about a miracle. Now we're back around to a miracle. I'll tell you, some of the greatest miracles you'll ever find is when you begin to speak the word. You speak the word, and these signs follow them that believe. You know what a believer does? Talks about what happened to them. A believer does, speaks the word of God. He says, the Lord Jesus, he's come to heal you. It doesn't matter how you judge it. It just doesn't matter. Speak the word. Sow it. Yes, some will get choked. Yes, some will be fall among thorns and rocks. And, so, and, and it won't bring forth the fruit that you expected it to bring forth. But that's not your job. Job, sow the word. Speak it out of your mouth. Speak it in prayer. Speak it when you're coming in and going out. Speak it everywhere you go. I find it's a great thing. I mean, in my office, I'm always talking about it. I had a great experience the other day. I had a little family that I, I've prayed for them before, and the kid came in with a big gash in his eye, and so I put it all back together and glued it up. And I was in a hurry. I was way behind. And I really shouldn't even have been doing it. But I did it because I wanted to do it, and I, I got it all fixed up. And I got to get moving. So I start moving. And, and they're walking out. I'm heading to my office to get the computer. So I go back to the next patient. And a uh, little girl looks up at her mom. Mom, he didn't pray for us. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I stopped, turned around, I said, you're absolutely right. Called the little boy down the hall, right there in the hall. We gathered up together, prayed for him. Bless him. Father, heal him in Jesus' name. I thought that was great. I was so excited. You know, she remembered that when the mom had come in with a very difficult problem, I had talked to them about the Word of God and said, this is what we need to do. And I had prayed for all the children. Talked to her about it. And that little girl did not forget. And she was not going to leave, even though it wasn't her that got cut. It was her brother. But she was not. He's supposed to pray for him. Okay? We're praying. That was so good. It was so wonderful. To have that happen, because this is what we're going to do. We're going to meet it out. We're going to give it out. We're going to give out the word of God. Just encouraging people constantly, saying, Jesus is the answer for that. Jesus is the answer for that. And many will just, you're nuts. You're weird. You're goofy. Well, fine. I don't care. But I'm going to tell them, because it's going to fall sometime on good ground. And there's going to be some, even with rocks and thorns of life, going to come back and go, man, that's so good, but I can just, I'm struggling with. You say, well, look, here's what you need to do. You call them into the word of God when you pray. Father, in Jesus' name. So with what measure you give out, it will be measured to you. What I'm calling you to do, what I'm telling you the word of God is, speak it out. We need to be a people that are so given to speaking and those that stop judging the ground. We're so good, we think, judging the ground. But we judge earthly judgment and not spiritual judgment. You know, if the person had looked at me, who preached the word to me and said, you know what? That guy's too prideful and too arrogant. It isn't going to work. And hadn't preached that word to me, I probably would have been killed. Now, I may have had more opportunities. God may have called somebody else to preach to me later. I, I, I mean, who knows? doesn't matter. But at that moment, my life, which was on the path of destruction, was pulled over and set on the road, the narrow road to life. 
that moment. It didn't happen later. It happened that that moment, that quickly, suddenly, I had gone off the place that everybody was at where it, it feels comfortable because everybody's going in the same direction. And then suddenly I'm pulled onto this narrow road. And then it begins to change decisions in your life. Many decisions are made differently. I didn't do the things that I did before. I didn't go the places I went before. The dreams that I'd had changed. Everything about my life was different just because I heard the word. Now, first thing that happened to me after that is I spoke that same word to the first opportunity I had. Went with my cousin and I preached the same word. I mean, it was verbatim what the guy had told me. I, I, you know, it's all I knew. I had this word and I knew that this was the way of life. And so I went to the same scriptures in the same order and spoke the same word that I'd heard. I tell you, that hearkening, doing what the word had put within me, that was a place where it began to grow much bigger in my life. It grew. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. I went back home and I began to do the same thing. I began to tell people, hey, we need to call and bring some people in that know this Bible better. Kind of, I didn't say it that way to people, but you know, you got somebody who's running the youth group who's teaching you nonsense and it's not according to the word and you got all these things around you and people around you and I just began to just be hungry. We gotta have more. We gotta have more of this. We gotta call this person. We gotta bring somebody in because because I had nobody around me to help me. Very, very little. And I began to hunger and hunger and hunger. And then God sent me down to San Diego to meet a group of people who are just as hungry Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Sat there in my chemistry class, sitting in the chair, and down in the front row is this crazy guy. I mean, he was crazy. But, you know, I loved crazy people, so it was easy. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then I met Ron White. And he took me to a Bible study at Cable Street, and that same crazy guy was there. <laughs> And he was playing a guitar, and he was so wild about it. It was really cool. And then he began to speak the word, and I was captured. I was captured just like that. This is my people. Here's my people. I found my people. Never, never went out. Never left after that. Never. Not one time. Never left. My heart was here because God had captured me. Right? It's so good. And it's been years of plowing years of learning, and years of coming to an understanding. And, you know, I like to think that it could all have been done much faster if I'd just been willing to hearken more. So we're going to hearken to this word. We heard it this morning. We're going to hearken to it. We're going to speak it out. We're going to speak it out. When I was in back east, I was walking around, and I, and I do this. I sing a lot, just sing ditties to myself and sing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. And apparently that's what my oldest son does too. I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of that, but his, his, his girlfriend um, <laughs> was that we met her and she goes, well now I know where he gets it. Because he does this thing. But it's like you want to speak it out. Even those things, just speaking it out. Reminding yourself. Speaking to yourself. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. This is what we do because we're giving it out. And every opportunity to talk to somebody, Jesus has the answer. Jesus is the answer. He has an answer for every need. I don't care what miracle you need tonight. Jesus has the answer. And what you're going to do is testify of the miracle that's in you. I'm going to testify to you that every breath I take comes from God. I'm going to testify to you that the life that he put within me came because of the salvation that he made by his own hand, and by his purposes and the things that he did for me and not anything that I did for myself, not of works of righteousness that I have done, but by my believing upon the name of Jesus Christ and upon the blood that he shed and upon everything that he's given unto me, that blood has come. And then my word and my testimony is going to be that. So I'm in my office and people talk to me and I'll say, well, you know what I found very clearly 
that when you're dealing with this fearful thing, that the word of God tells you that perfect love casts out all fear. So that's what I talk about. Every time they come in, instead of talking about anxiety and how you need medication, I start talking about if you have anxiety, you need to pray. If you have anxiety, you need to understand perfect love. And the only perfect love you will ever find, trust me, I've looked, the only perfect love you'll ever find is in Jesus. It's the answer. You begin to know these things so well that that's what you speak out. That's what you tell people. Here's the prescription for you. You have fear and anxiety, prayer, and knowing how much God loves you. There you go. If you would do these things, your anxiety will leave. And then we'll pray. And it'll happen. This is the word of God. It's the word of God. Speak it out. So here's, again, I just want to reiterate it for you. Here's the word to you that I do not want you to forget. With what measure you give out, it will be measured to you. We hear it all the time, activate. We hear it all the time, get moving. Start doing something. You're telling the Lord you want spiritual gifts. If you're not out doing something where you need them, then why do you need them? You need to be activated. Well, how do I get activated? Start speaking out everything I receive. I heard that word this morning. It was so powerful to me. It's something I knew, but it's now deeper in me than it was before. Speak it out. Say the word. This is what we're going to do. Are we going to do this? Now, whatever your miracle you need is, I want you to think about it. All the people that raised your hand earlier, I want you to think about what that miracle is. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to speak the word, the word of God that we know. He wants to heal you. He wants to bless you. He wants to keep you. There are things to do, just like the prescription. If your problem is anxiety, if you're saying, I'm, I'm anxious all the time. I'm worried all the time. I'm fearful all the time. There's an answer. The answer is given to you. You need to avail yourself of the answer. He's telling you, in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request made known unto God. So if you're anxious, you're afraid the roof is going to fall in, say, Father, in Jesus' name, hold up the roof. It's that simple. It's all you have to do. And the other prescription is to know this. God loves you. He loves you so much. So in like manner, there's other prescriptions. Healing has a prescription for it. It's an understanding of something. First of all, you know the word of God. It says this, by his stripes, you were healed. Okay? You know this. You understand that the scripture says that. It's very clear. All of Isaiah 53 talks about the details of everything that Jesus purchased for us by all that he suffered. Down to the fact that he suffered chastisement so you could have peace. I mean, just even the littlest things in your life, he took care of all of it in one offering. It's by one offering. But he's giving, he's giving unto you the word for your miracle. And, and if you don't know, people can counsel you and help you find that place. But people, I'm sure you know. It's very simple. If you know nothing else, call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. So we're going to pray. And you're going to think about the miracle that you need. And we're going to believe that God's going to do it. And then if, if, if there's anybody that wants prayer, wants more prayer, wants to hook up your faith with, with one of the ministers in the house, fine, you can come up for prayer. We'll do that. We're going to pray corporately. We're going to believe that your miracle is going to be met, whatever it might be. Let me just tell you one other. If you need a financial miracle, the prescription in the Word of God is what? Give. You give. What measure you give, it will be given unto you again. Isn't that amazing? You want a financial miracle, it says give. It's a little bit counterintuitive to the natural mind. But that's what he tells us to do. So a lot of times people will say, I need a financial miracle. The Lord's got the financial miracle. And then he asks you to do something. He says, give this. And you don't do it. You don't hearken. You just heard the word, but you didn't do what he told you to do. I don't know where it is that he told you to do. Whatever it is that he told you to do. Word of God will tell you to do things. If you will do what he says, you will be blessed. Right? So, Father, take that miracle. Father, in Jesus' name, there are many here that came for a miracle. Father, there are many here that need a miracle. Financial miracle, physical miracle, miracle in their spirit, whatever it might be, understanding in their mind. Father, I thank you that you, Lord Jesus, are the answer to every need. Lord, that every single one here is going to learn how to hearken to your word, to do what you said, to act upon what they hear, 
to speak out the word that has become real to them. Father, I thank you that they're going to be hearers of the word and doers of the word and not hearers only. Father, those miracles that people are bringing before you, I ask you right now to meet every single need. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for healing where it didn't seem possible. I thank you for miracles in the body. Lord, I thank you for cells coming in where they're supposed to be, for things being made right. Lord, for infections being destroyed. In Jesus' name, every power of darkness, everything that would come and try to testify against that which Jesus has done is broken now in Jesus' name. So it cannot any longer remain in your life, whatever it might be. The healing comes. The healing comes right now. Whoever it is that needs the healing, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for miracles. Lord, I thank you for a miracle work in church who's going to go forth and begin to do as they've been told so many times to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Lord, we're not going to any longer try to figure it out. We're not going to any longer try to look at the ground. We're not going to any longer try to say, well, the situation's not right. Lord, we're going to do what you commanded us to do. Every demonic thing that we see, we're going to take authority over it and tell it to leave. We're going to tell it to go. We're going to tread upon it. We're going to break its power and say, you must go. So that people that don't even understand what held them back will be set free. So that they might hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name. Lord, a powerful evangelism from this place. Lord, a powerful moving of your spirit. Lord, that the word of God would go forth and we would see many saved and many healed, many set free, many delivered. Father, even starting with the one. Father, in Jesus' name, we will have it. We will have it. We will have it because we will not allow it to be any other way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, it's broken now. Oh God, my God. You and you alone have set us in a large, large place. Lord, as we stand in this little room, Lord, we know you set us in a large, large place. Lord, and you have made a way where there didn't seem to be a way. Lord, there's a way for us to follow after you and to do everything you commanded us to do. Lord, we will not be denied. We will not sit still. We will not look at a thing and judge it by our mind. Lord, but we will speak your word. Lord, you have blessed us. You have called us. You have purposed. You've given us vision. Lord, you have directed us. It has been straight. It has been narrow. It has been right in every way. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we're going to see the fulfillment of all of your purposes. Oh, God, it will happen in Jesus' name. Lord, this miracle that we need. This miracle, Lord, this direction, this fulfillment of all of your purposes, Lord, that we might minister to people in the way you desire us to, Lord, with the love of Jesus Christ flowing out of us, Lord, that we might bless people. Oh God, we want to be effective ministers of your gospel. Lord, we want to be effective. Lord, we don't want to be barren and unfruitful in any way any longer. Lord, we want to be blessed by you. So Lord, we're going to give out of the measure we've received that we might receive more. And when we get that, we're going to give it out too. And when we get more, we're going to give that out too. We're going to not stop to give out in everything that we do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh God, my God. Whew. And the devil's one of my Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. You have some? Good. Parama. Yeah, yeah. So no man the devil's. Just two things really quickly. As um Stuart was ministering, I just want to read this real quick. Romans eight, twenty eight.
So good. So good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love your presence. We love your presence. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you'd be confident in knowing who God is to you, if you'd be confident in the word that he's spoken, things change, things change. I've been, I've been growing in this. It's been so good. Circumstances are always there. They're going to be there till the day we die. And most of the time, those circumstances are contrary to what God's word has said. We have to decide and recognize that the word of God is what we live by. I was reminded of this story as, as Pastor Stewart was ministering. And you've probably heard it before, Pastor Mark's ministered. There was a woman, I was like back in the, the late 40s or so. She was in a church and she had this massive goiter on her neck. She went up, she got prayer, and she received her healing, right? So she would come up every Sunday. They would have people testify of a healing that God had done. She'd come up and she would testify, and she'd thank God that this goiter had been healed. The goiter was still there. And every, every Sunday for a year, she came up and she gave this testimony. And then the Sunday, there was a guest minister there, and the pastor's on the platform, and he sees the lady coming down. He's like, oh, no, here she comes. How embarrassing. What's wrong with this lady? Doesn't she realize she still needs prayer? People would try to, the goiter's still on your neck. Don't you realize you need to be healed? And she would look at them like they're nuts. What are you talking about? I've been healed. And so she's up there testifying. She's like, I just thanking God that he healed my neck. And before their eyes, this thing shrinks down and disappears. And they go, nuts. And she's like, what's wrong with you guys? This thing's been healed for a year. Okay? So I don't know if it was supernatural that God you know, she didn't see it. She didn't look in the mirror or what. But I want to encourage you in this. Receive the miracle. Receive it. Right? If you're standing here at this part of the line, right? We pray for you. The Holy Ghost imparts a miracle. Right there. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for you to get up and then move down to the end of the line and have us pray for you again. We'd ask what, what happened. Did you not receive the miracle? Okay? Now, we'll, we'll be here to stand with you in faith, to thank God that the complete manifestation of the miracle is worked. But there's got to be a point where we come to a place of maturity where we are able to receive from God, to receive it and know that it is done, to know that it's done. And how, how do we know whether we're just completely off our rock or not? Well, does it line up with the word? Because the word is truth. The circumstances are going to tell you a lot of things. What might be going on is completely opposite of what the word might be saying. But if you will stand in the truth, if you will stand in the word of God, what he has spoken and what he's delivered to you, you will see the change and the miracle that God has given. He's a faithful God. We are persuaded that nothing can separate us from the love. Nothing can separate us from the love. If you be confident in that, it's so good, Pastor Stuart Minister. If we will recognize what God has purposed for all of our lives. It'd be great change. It'd be great change. Everyone, stand with me, please. Father, we love you. We love you. We bless you. We praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is ministering to many of you right now. Just raise your hands and receive now. Whatever you have need of, take it to the Father. He is here. He is faithful. He is just and He is righteous. He mends the broken heart. He heals the sick body. He restores the broken heart. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Know and believe the love that God has for you. And do not let anything separate you. Father, I thank you for the healing anointing of the Holy Ghost that goes forth and ministers to every heart. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Father, thank you so much that you teach us to speak the word in faith and to receive. You make it so easy for us. You make it so easy. All we have to do is believe and receive. I thank you, Father, that every person will learn how to receive like they never have.
Father, to understand the limitless supply that you have poured out. Every answer has already been supplied. Every need that we could possibly have has already been taken care of. Because you are a good Father. You're a good Father. We love you and bless you and we praise you. Father, we just commit our lives again this night to say we are yours. Father, we want nothing to do with this world. We want nothing to do with the things of this world. We are yours. Father, I thank you that you put in each person a fresh consecration to live for you, to live radically for you. Father, we want nothing more than to see your glory revealed, to see your face, Lord Jesus, to see your church shine, to see your church rise, to see every person fulfill their destiny and their purpose. Father, to see every person live out the life of Christ Jesus. I thank you, Father, for the miracle power of the Holy Ghost that works now, that moves upon every life. You are so good. You are so good. You are so good. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Anyone that needs prayer, anyone that needs a healing, come. We're going to pray. We'll minister. We'll be helpers of your faith. But I want you to know, this week, God is asking you to come and seek him like you never have. He's asking you to come and look to him as your supply. We love when you come and when you draw on the anointing that God has put in the house. But draw on the anointing that God has placed within you. Activate. Activate and see God grow you and mature you. It's left to you to decide how quickly you'll mature. I've been praying for rapid spiritual growth. I want to grow into the measure of the maturity, the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ, even unto a perfect man. So that there is nothing, there is nothing that is able to stand in the way of the ministry of the gospel. Father's ready. Father's ready. He's looking for our faithfulness. He's looking for our commitment, our, our heart to be sold out. But the supply is there ready. Ready and waiting. Tap into that supply and watch everything come into perfect alignment with the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. We love you and bless you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Come up if you have a need. Come up. We'll pray for you. Soak in the presence of God. Let God just speak to you. This atmosphere is wonderful to be able to touch heaven. It's wonderful when we break through into a realm where, where it's just easy, where it just flows. You need to make sure that you take advantage of that because when the circumstances of the week start happening, the cares, whatever, other, uh, other priorities, Sometimes you can get bogged down. Make sure that you let the river flow. Let the river flow every time. If you, you can just line up along the front here. Line up along the front. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.